evening YouTube. Melvin Quant Geekery with a review of honestly probably the best fiction book I've read in a couple years. Um that is saying something. So this book you may have heard of Black Leopard Red Wolf Marlon James it it's a lot of book um it is 600 pages it is a it is a pitch black fantasy <laughs> I'm not I can't even it would be an hour video which I've done by accident to give get into the plot of this thing. Um, I would just say, if you wanted to get a brief summary, listen to Chris Isaac's Wicked Game, and that is, I swear, that entire song is split apart, and it, the, I swear, they're like individual verses that fit each section of this book. Because the hook at the end is, the world is only going to break your, like, I don't want to fall in love. And I don't want to fall in love. The world is only going to break your heart. The world is only going to break your heart. Nobody loves no one. And if you have read the book, you're going to know how many times that gets said. Nobody loves no one because that the the contradiction of that sentence permeates the entirety of the book that there are so many people that do so many horrible things but no matter how terrible, no matter how horrible they are, and they are horrible. Like, you've got all kinds of monsters. You've got supernatural beings. You've got humans being absolutely terrible. That theme that nobody loves no one, that everybody feels some human connection to someone else, permeates all of it. Now, that does not mean that you have your usual... Let me put it like this. One of the common themes is someone says a bunch of entitled shit while hurting people, and someone like Batman, who's seen as this hard ass, just lets them go because they gave their sob story. Because that's what counts as social justice today. So instead of someone breaking in and taking some property or beating up some random person because they were kids and they were in a broken home and the system is racist, so they punched a 80-year-old black woman and Batman's going to let him go, or we'll just pretend that that never happens in a place like Gotham City. Yeah, Gotham City no longer has the knockout game because people really would feel like punching the shit out of a snot-nosed kid that decided to knock out an, a, a senior citizen. Yeah, there is a power fantasy that a kid that decides to beat up a random old lady and beat them into a near coma should probably get the shit kicked out of them. Well, that's problematic. So we're just going to pretend that that never happens to old people. No. No, this, this book basically says, this is what happened to make you find out what makes that kid into someone that does that, and then you realize that they do get their rocks off doing it. So they're not doing this because they're hurt. They're doing it because hurting other people has been conditioned into them to be pleasurable. So they actually feel happy hurting people. That's why they do it. And that restores the agency on the person doing the action. Probably a big part of that is the fact that 
he was born in Jamaica. Um, and he's a black person. And one of the themes about Jamaica is that it was the Middle Passage. Not everybody who went to Jamaica stayed in Jamaica. Most of them ended up during the Atlantic slave trade going somewhere else, either the United States, Brazil, Cuba, and different destinations had different outcomes. They were all bad. Um, Brazil, you were just used up, like black people were just used up by the million. Now you can say, oh, there's, there's such a great progressive place now, not like the United States. And if only your ancestors had gone there, if your ancestors had gone there, three and four chances, you would have no descent. There would be no descendants and you would not fucking exist because they, when they went over there, they just died. They worked them to death within five to seven years. That's what happened. And Cuba wasn't much better. There were no happy endings. In fact, the book explicitly talks about how the idea of a happily ever after ending is the only thing that's complete bullshit. Every character becomes morally compromised based on the environment that they're in. Character is not independent of environment. Now, just because character is not independent of environment does not mean that persons are devoid of all agency. Environment is a factor in the decision. The person is, in fact, a factor in the decisions and taking their action. A regular theme in the series is witchcraft. And first, there are warlocks. There are men that perform magic. And there's some very powerful beings that are male. There are also witches who get their abilities uh, through human sacrifice. Now, this is one of those things that, for those that are not aware there are, um, and, and it's been just, don't listen to woke idiots telling you that at no point in all African history were human sacrifices made. That is actually a fucking lie. And you have every reason to believe that's a lie because it turns out that in almost every society, they did at some point have human sacrifices. Yes, the Greeks had scenarios where they would sacrifice people. Japan, in ancient times, had reasons, had circumstances where they would sacrifice people. That was seen as the inspiration for the Kushinada. China has had instances where they've had to sacrifice people. The Bible, Jephthah, one of the judges of Israel, actually did perform a human sacrifice because he said he would do it. Um... In the Chronicles, there was a pagan king that sacrificed one of his own sons. And then as a result of that sacrifice, he was able to overcome the armies of Israel. Vikings had human sacrifices. Uh, the Celtics of Britannia had human sacrifices. It wasn't a thing that happened as often as the Aztecs and, Ma and Incas, or Ma um, I think the Mayans, the Aztecs and Mayans. However, they still happened. You can argue that the diffusion of violence in capitalist societies is in fact just a diffused version of that human sacrifice where people are converted into labor and all that other stuff. You can make that argument. That's not what's being said. What's said instead is, oh, everything was this nice uh, idealized scenario that's so much better than now. And if you're in the middle passage, it's really hard to believe that because unlike the United States, where the end of the Atlantic slave trade brought about an aggressive need to f completely commodify uh, black people into product. Instead, in Jamaica, the end of the Atlantic slave trade meant that in X number of years, you're not going to have slaves anymore. So they don't have the same reasons to stamp out the existing culture beforehand. As a result, Jamaica, uh, the Caribbean, 
there's a more intact record through cultural history of how people ended up getting into the situation of being enslaved. Mostly because the way that the slave trade works is those areas in the Caribbean were part of the Middle Passage. Most of them don't end there. They arrive, they're processed, and then they're sent to a final destination. When the Atlantic slave trade ended, most of the Africans... Most of the African slaves on those islands, well, some of them, but Jamaica was actually a more uh, intermittent area. So many of the slaves in Jamaica at the time of the end of the slave trade were in transit. So they were born free, forcibly enslaved, put on the boat, unloaded on the boat, and then... Uh, they're going to have to be enslaved in Jamaica. They're not going anywhere else. And in 45 years, they're all going, in 40 years, they're all going to be free anyway. Now, the masters could do whatever they're going to do, work them to death and all these other things. And those things all happen. But at the end of it, with all the racism, systemic racism, all those other things, uh, the clear white domination of Jamaica that still exists today, if we're being honest, you you have a different historical record. It's not, oh, everything was just fine in the mother country. Well, first, it wouldn't be a mother country. It would be a group of tribes that had been forcibly enslaved by rival tribes. This idea of a black identity is an oxymoron. It, In fact, the idea that you can have multi multiple ethnicities gathered together, getting along, and not creating an ethnic hierarchy really only exists in the United States as a fiction. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but have you noticed that different ethnic groups that are all white can be stereotyped and that very few of them have qualities that are marketed as positive leadership qualities unless they're Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Catholics tend to be superstitious. Italians tend to be criminal. Irish tend to be indolent, but with some signs of intelligence. Russians are crude, et cetera, et cetera. Just the list of stereotypes. But really the only people that are really good at being leaders in an executive sense are basically your English and your German and your Scandinavian. Incidentally, uh, the Norse, as in the North, as in those same Scandinavians, made up a large portion of the ruling class of England. Go figure. That aside, you don't have the lovely, rosy, idealistic... England of a Tolkien. You don't have the standard high fantasy where the kings are noble and selfless. This is a dark fantasy. Um, I hate that term. I would say it's an economically literate fantasy. You're not going to have a pre-industrial or fuck it, an industrial society in a resource rich area where you're not going to have a system that promotes and replicates human suffering on a fractal scale. The sufferings and horror that women go through and it's it ain't limited to women by any stretch. However, women are forced into situations where they are, in many cases, powerless. And the way that they obtain power, either through politics or through witchcraft, which is really, it's human sacrifice. (laughs) Right? Um, And you have a woman called the Moon Witch, who is an incredibly powerful witch, who has lived for 300 years, and she's leading this group to rescue a child and she's amazingly powerful like 
you would get that if this were done as an adaptation by the usual suspects, they would have to cast her in a heroic light that was unambiguous. And the the system that exists in that world is pretty clear cut. Essentially, if you're getting a large amount of power and the usual way that someone gets it is by being a horrible human being, at some point, you are a horrible human being. You might decide to not be that horrible human being anymore. And in fact, one of the reasons that the main character, who's called Tracker, is able to do a lot of the things he does is because he worked with a witch that had stopped being that horrible human being. So they, that this witch was an incredibly powerful witch. And Tracker, even as a child, immediately calls her out on something that we find out later in the book. Uh, the way that a witch becomes an incredibly powerful witch is through human sacrifice. I mean, come on now, like, you don't have, you don't have, and, but this powerful witch, they don't have to do that. They don't have to keep doing that. But in order for them to become that powerful the first time, they had to do it. And from there, we get the story, it flows, and when you get that idea that you can either get power by doing something horrible to an innocent person or you can just struggle and a repeated theme is the people that don't do the horrible things to get power are either forced to endure them or either forced to endure abuse and horror time and time and time again or and I keep this in mind or they are the benefits of exorbitant privilege from someone who had done those horrible things and both Tracker and his love interest are mere images of having that extreme privilege in Tracker's case uh, one he has um, he has two things. Uh, one of them is, you know, it makes you me think of drag a demon slayer because he has an incredible sense of smell. And the other uh, makes me think of a lot of things that are happening in the last few years in regard to police brutality. He is immune to all metals. Uh, metal, uh, metal weapons can't hurt him in any way. Arrows can't hurt him. Uh, swords can't hurt him. Axes can't cut his skin. Metallic-based poisons, which, by the way, is actually a lot of venom, a lot of poison uh, is based on metallic reaction, can't hurt him. Um, yeah. However, wouldn't, uh, you know, blunt force trauma, that can hurt him. Um, so he's got enhanced, he has superhuman smell, he has... You, the reason it's called Red Wolf is that his skin is painted red and he has a wolf eye, which gives him incredible enhanced sight. So he has enhanced sight, enhanced smell, and his skin is basically bulletproof. And the themes here, like I said, nobody loves no one. All these people doing all these horrible things have some capacity to love somebody. Even the monster, even most of the monsters show signs of having some affection for some other person. Um, even though they're vicious and, you know, feed on people and, and enjoy inflicting pain. And there's a lot of sexual assault in this book. Um, it does not glamorize it in any way. It is brutal. It is vile. The people doing it are vile. And you also see that 
they are, or at one point, some things have been done to them. Even if you don't get that backstory, you understand that the system and the world that they are living in, while all black, is still a horrible system. In part because it's like the antidote to the whole Wakanda mythology that you're going to have a noble kingdom like Musi Musi that won't ha- that has slaves but the good slavery which is still fucking stupid as shit yet that's the mythology that I've had to hear growing up in the US I'm I'm from the US I've heard that mythology I'm like no Every single system that has kings, every system that has slavery, it has to come from the system and regime itself to be sustained. Without a government, without a state, you can't enslave somebody. You can just forcibly hold them against their will. Like somebody kidnaps someone off the street, chains them into their basement. We wouldn't call that slavery. Yet somebody goes to a governor and says, oh, I want to hold this person whether they want to be held or not. Or they can be pressed into service, which is that someone is grabbed off the street, forced into the army where they get shot or drowned to death in the the king's navy. So I'm sick of this idea that, and again, this is something from the United States, this is something that really only exists in the United States, that Slavery was seen as a moral action that doesn't have anything to do with the government. No, it's entirely based on the government. If you have no government, you have no slavery. That doesn't mean you don't have violence. It doesn't mean that you don't end up with gangs kidnapping people. So anarchy isn't going to, isn't going to save you either. And again, this book basically says, if we're dealing with actual people, you're going to get horrible shit all the nobility that you see in something like lord of the rings you know is idealistic and not it's not sincere it's not how people actually are and tolkien has had done interviews where he essentially said he could imagine immediately a thriller where people in a later age are stuck going against the corruption that took over. And he's like, he, he, you don't need any talent to write that story because that is the natural state of things. That's the beauty of the Lord of the Rings is somebody telling you that we need to destroy this ring because it's so evil and powerful and that being completely sincere and it being taken seriously and every and and large portions of the population rising to the occasion without an ulterior motive that's beautiful it's also not how people actually are and tolkien was fully aware of that the people reading tolkien were are fully aware of that like if you're an adult and you're reading tolkien you know that's not how kings actually were You know that's not how kings would actually be. You know that's not how councils and counselors would be that selfless and that noble at scale. Come on. Don't even get don't even get me started on Gandalf because Gandalf was per is just There is a sequel called Moon Witch Spider King and uh the Moon Witch is a central character in this story and chef's kiss to what he does with your Gandalf type character because wow just I mean the fact that you have the strong black woman being your Gandalf and then he basically says no, we're not going to do Black Lord of the Rings. We're going to ju- we're going to have black people and it's going to be all of these black kingdoms, all of this magic, all of this science, all of this alchemy. And then we're going to actually go right into 
how economic systems actually worked before the slave trade and during the slave trade. And nothing really changed except the scale of cruelty. Every horrible thing that happened in the slave trade had happened before the Atlantic slave trade. The only difference was scale and scope. That it affected more areas of life and that it affected more people in their lives. A difference of magnitude, not of kind. And I'm not going into the plot details, but I mean, we're almost a half hour in. I'm telling you, this is a hard read, but it is a beautifully composed. And it sells, I mean, it's a book that just runs. This guy's books, they sell circles around comics. Like, like you don't have a Neil Gaiman's work, a Neil Gaiman's work. His prose fiction runs circles around mainstream comics. And he writes prolifically. The best comic book writers that also write prose fiction, their prose fiction does better than comics. And the reason is they are really good writers. When I read this, I'm reading an amazing writer and his philosophy, I don't agree with 100%. However, I respect the hell out of his approach. Um, when the man that Tracker falls in love with shows that he is that shining white knight type person with unflinching moral integrity. And he's also a white guy. It gets established that he has a background that was uniquely blessed, not just in terms of material wealth, but also in terms of the absence of abuse. And this person, in true white knight fashion, calls out the hypocrisy of his own culture and the hypocrisy of the culture that he goes to in Africa. So this guy, when, you know, this white guy is basically saying he's from privilege. He knows he's from privilege. And he also says that in some, and he also says, this system is horrible. The system he was coming from is horrible. And he was trying to do the right thing by taking a job in law enforcement. And the black guy is like, I just got done saving, you know, the black, spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. Um, if you're talking, if you're thinking that law enforcement in a system where women's primary means of self-empowerment is kidnapping someone else's child and, and murdering it. The law enforcement is um, is not great. Actually, the law enforcement is fucking terrible. All the institutions are corrupt. It's just shitty all around. And for a lot of the third world that is caught up in, well, the same shit that they were in beforehand. Which, again, Jamaican from the Middle Passage, like, they didn't get conquered because they were so smart. They got conquered because the leadership was terrible. They didn't get enslaved because the continent was filled with cooperation. They got enslaved because everyone because the leader the people on that continent were completely caught up in short-sighted thinking. That doesn't mean that they stop being human. It does mean that you need to treat an adult like an adult. You make terrible decisions. You do need to face consequences for those decisions. And if you know what the consequences are, and that's what gives you a reward, then yeah, you get caught. You pay the price. It's what it is. There's a lot of money to be made set, trying to smuggle drugs into Singapore. Because if you get caught, you die. With that said, nobody loves no one. Have a blessed one.